We'll take our reading this evening from the Gospel according to St. Matthew. Another parable he proposed to them, saying, The kingdom of heaven is likened to a man that sowed good seeds in his field. But while men were asleep, his enemy came and over-sowed cockle among the wheat and went his way. And when the blade was sprung up and had brought forth fruit, then appeared also the cockle. And the servants of the good man of the house coming said to him, Sir, didst thou not sow good seed in thy field? Whence then hath it cockle? And he said to them, An enemy hath done this. And the servants said to him, Wilt thou that we go and gather it up? And he said, No, thus perhaps gathering up the cockle, you root up the wheat also together with it. Suffer both to grow until the harvest. And in the time of the harvest, I will say to the reapers, Gather up first the cockle and bind it into bundles to burn. But the wheat gather ye into my barn. So far, the Holy Gospel according to St. Matthew. In the year 2003, Judge Robert Bork wrote a treatise on the problems facing modern America entitled Slouching Towards Gomorrah, Modern Liberalism and American Decline. Many have noted since then how we are more than merely slouching towards Gomorrah, but rather more like steaming or speeding headlong in that direction. One ill-disposed author seeking to mock the good judge, Robert Bork, certainly agreed with this progression of events and direction of things, and so he wrote a book entitled Skipping Towards Gomorrah. He was happy that we were heading in that direction. Well, as we all know of June 26, 2015, as the decision from the Supreme Court indicates, ruled on that day, we are no longer slouching, steaming, let alone skipping towards this detestable destination. We have indeed pulled into the station named Sodom and Gomorrah. And many countries around the world are pulling in right behind us. Now much could be said about the evil of this place, but everyone with faith and common sense knows perfectly well that this is not a good thing. This is not a good place to be. What they do here is not normal, nor healthy, nor natural. Although this perversion in fallen man has been around from time immemorial, nevertheless, when it is accepted and glorified as it was in Gomorrah, and now even legalized, history shows that such sodomitical societies fail miserably. We are already noticing some strange things huge bronze statue of Satan, Bohomet, being unveiled for public veneration, which for his followers often means immodest, impure, and unnatural acts performed in public. And not surprisingly, that is exactly what happened when they unveiled that statue. Meanwhile, churches are closed down, dismantled, or sold off, Crosses of our Savior are removed. Statues of the Mother of God are defaced or destroyed. Little babies are killed with their body parts and their eggs sold as a commodity on the market. With little or no outcry or public objection. We see strange people about more and more pierced, tattooed, defaced. What is more, privacy seems to be something hard to secure in nearly every category. Depression, drug, and alcohol use are commonplace with the psychological clinics and divorce courts 
overflowing with customers. This is the Pentopolis, the five cities of Sodom and Gomorrah, where nothing is sacred except pleasure. And we should not wonder why this place was once upon a time destroyed by heavenly fire. We have rebuilt it. Yet it is important for us to realize that saints have been here before and have survived. Once again, that's one of the themes of this mission. Listen to Venerable Mother Mary of Agrida. These amazing words. She writes, Surrounded by the sorrows of death and perdition, and beset by the flames of Sodom and Babylon, in which we live, God liberated me from the portals of sorrow into which I was enticed to enter. My enemies forming visions of fallacious and deceitful delights for the misleading of my senses and the capture of them by pretended pleasures, set their allurements upon me in order that I might blindly turn toward these flames and be consumed by them. What's she saying? These devils were around her showing her videos, films, pictures. So you might say, well... There's never been a time like this, Father. We've got these videos and TV and movies. Read the lies of the saints. Several of them had videos, big screens of things going on, shown them. Wicked films. And they're like going, ah. We've been here before in the saints, even before these things were invented. But from all these snares laid for my footsteps, the Most High has delivered me, writes Mother Mary Agrida, elevating my spirit and teaching me by the most efficacious admonitions the way of perfection. And here's the key line for us. He invited me to a spiritualized and angelic life and obliged me to live so cautiously that in the midst of the furnace the fire touched me not. He invited me to a life spiritualized and angelic. And that is what I want for each of you. A life spiritualized and angelic. A life lived cautiously in the midst of the furnace, such that the fire will not touch thee. Others have done this. So can we. And to make this possible, we need a good understanding of morality that protects us from the major vices prevalent in this place. Thus, the conference of the mission tonight on morality. Let us then begin by seeking to understand why God has allowed the train of history to arrive at this station. First of all, because many have sinned against the Lord and disobeyed His commandments, and sadly continue to do so. Thus, as hard as this may sound, we deserve this, we deserve it, for our sins. Too many were sleeping, thereby allowing the cockle to be sown. Hence the Scriptures say, All that Thou hast done to us, O Lord, Thou hast done in true judgment, because we have sinned against Thee, and we have not obeyed thy commandments. So we deserve it, as hard as it is to hear. Second of all, God wants us to realize this life, this earth, this place is not our home. We are made for higher things than the pleasures of the flesh and worldly delights. Let us then increase our desire to be delivered from this valley Increase our desire to be home in heaven where we belong. Let us not fail as did the wife of Lot. Her desire was to be in Sodom. And so she turned into a pillar of salt. Third of all, the train of history has arrived at the station because more or less we have been in a revolution for some centuries now, and this is what they produce, debauchery. As Robert Bork put it, we're slouching toward this direction for a while. 
As everyone should know, revolutions are at root a breaking free of God's created order in some way. They are motivated by an unwillingness to conform to God and his plan. They are an attempt to establish a new creation, if that were possible. And here we see one of the reasons why myth, fantasy, and fables are so popular at this time. They give people a way to accept a new created order that fits them and their way of thinking. In any case, we must never forget that revolutions are always bad, always hurtful to God and His church. They seek to overturn the created order in some way, which causes nothing but problems, even many moral and physical disasters. When we look at revolution, we know its source and its headquarters are down in the earth. In other words, they ultimately come up from hell and the devil. What is more, they're always aimed at bringing down the holy Catholic Church and her faithful members. The scriptures speak of this revolution as being like a flood of foul water flowing from the mouth of the devil in the Apocalypse chapter 12. Thus, the revolution is primarily a spoken word. A false word to counter and contradict the true word of God. So social engineering is always preceded by verbal engineering. The sacred scriptures from both the Old and the New Testaments tell us what the revolution found in the Patopolis looks like five cities of Sodom and Gomorrah. In the Old Testament, in the Book of Wisdom, it comes to our aid in revealing what happens when, quote, men serving their affections, serving the creature rather than the creator, enter into a great war of ignorance and call so many and so great evils peace so that now they neither keep life nor marriage undefiled but one killeth another through envy or grieveth him by adultery. Does this sound familiar, anybody? Wait a minute now, let's see here. So that now they neither keep life. Planned Parenthood come to mind, currently selling baby parts and organs as a commodity with no outrage, it seems. How about grieveth him by adultery? Does the scandal of the so-called Ashley Madison online infidelity and married dating company ring any bells? If you don't know, this is an online infidelity and dating company that claims to have 40 million members signed up. Their motto is, life is short, have an affair. And all their data was leaked And people are committing suicide because people found out they were involved in all these adulterous affairs. Again, the scriptures say, he grieveth him by adultery. It goes on to say, and all things are mingled together, blood, murder, theft, and dissimulation. Dissimulation, does that sound familiar? playing with the meaning of words, redefining what it means to abort a baby, redefining what marriage is, redefining what gaiety means. Love, mercy, and so on are played with. Dissimulation. The scriptures go on. Corruption and unfaithfulness, tumults and perjury, disquieting of the good, forgetfulness of God, defiling of souls, and we can think especially of children, Changing of nature, read here, changing the natural law as our Supreme Court has attempted to do various times, or how various people are attempting to change their own gender. It goes on, the scriptures, disorder in marriage and the irregularity of adultery and uncleanness. For either they are mad when they are merry, or they prophesy lies, or they live unjustly, or easily forswear themselves. The truth means nothing to these people. 
That's the book of wisdom, chapter 14. So, truth, nobility, honor, fidelity mean nothing in this place. In the New Testament, we find this teaching of St. Peter, the first pope, in his second letter, wherein he describes those who enjoy, who like dwelling in the Pentapolis, those who enjoy skipping here as a preferred destination. Such ones are men who, quote, walk after the flesh in the lust of uncleanness and despise government, audacious, self-willed, blaspheming, end quote. Then St. Peter goes on to describe such residents as irrational beasts, naturally tending to destruction, blaspheming those things which they know not, sporting themselves to excess. That's a quality of modern American life. Sports. Sporting themselves to excess. Rioting in their feasts having eyes full of adultery. In other words, looking at immodest and obscene pictures regularly, movies, books, billboards, they're all over. It's readily available. It's the biggest moneymaker in the world. Fountains without water, St. Peter calls them, and clouds tossed with whirlwinds. No wonder... The psychological clinics are, and divorce courts are very busy in the Pentapolis. But note the major elements listed by St. Peter. Blasphemy, falsity, impurity, violence, disorder, and the perverting of nature. These are all revolution. This is revolution. We will not serve God's order. We will do our own thing. And this is the result. So much for living in the valley of the Pentapolis. This is not a place to call home, nor a place to get used to, as it will surely lead to depression, to forgetfulness of God, even atheism, and ultimately the eternal loss of our souls. Thus, St. Paul says, Be not deceived, God is not mocked. For what things a man shall sow, those also shall he reap. For he that soweth in his flesh of the flesh also shall reap corruption. But he that soweth in the Spirit, of the Spirit shall reap life everlasting. Now, as a result of our arriving here, the faithful of God are forced to live in a morally toxic and polluted environment. As St. Peter himself admits, saying, Lot was oppressed by the injustice and lewd conversation of the wicked. For in sight and hearing he was just, dwelling among them who from day to day vexed the just soul with unjust works. St. Peter. So injustice, lewd conversation, blasphemy from day to day vex and oppress the good Christian soul living here. The place is covered in smog. Pollutants that are hard to escape. Now, smog does two things. It surrounds and it intoxicates. It surrounds and it intoxicates those who imbibe it. So let's consider these. The intoxication we'll just kind of consider as we go through. But the surrounding, let's talk about that. It surrounds us. This is a very important factor of the Pentapolis because many souls striving for heaven are now forced to work side by side with people who love and embrace much of what Sodom offers. We have to live next door to these citizens, shop at the same stores and recreate in the same parks. We go about our daily business but are constantly vexed by injustice. Lewd conversation and blasphemy spewing forth from major media outlets as well as from our fellow men. Think of the young growing up in today's world. They are often confronted with many evils and temptations we never knew at their age. What to do? Well, we can't run away because there's nowhere to run. 
And there's more reasons why we can't run away. We'll talk about that. As one of the 99 left behind, we are wheat in the midst of a field overflowing with cockle. As we heard in the gospel, we must suffer both to grow until the harvest. And that means we must keep our Catholic faith, our Catholic identity intact against strong forces in order to survive until the angels come to harvest. In other words, we cannot escape the Pentapolis, but must persevere in this field until we are granted an exit visa and angelic guides, as was Lot. We must remain vigilant lest we ourselves grow slack and weak in this toxic environment and end by adding to it ourselves and perish along with it. Let us not despair, however. Once again, others have been here before and they show us what to do. They show us the way. We find a type of this in the life of St. Joan of Arc. When she was captured by the Burgundians and about to be sold to the English for a king's ransom, she attempted to escape. This she did despite her voices telling her to stay the course and endure the trial. But she did not listen. The only time, the only time she did not listen. In her attempt to escape, she fell from a tower bruised and senseless. Although she did not break a bone, she did not come to herself for some days. What is more, Joan, when she was in prison, was from then on surrounded by evil-minded, impure jailers as wheat surrounded by cockle. Day and night, a little pure virginal girl surrounded by evil-minded men. She survived. She was like a Daniel in the den of lions. She shows us we too can survive. We have been here before in Joan. We've been here before in Daniel. The lesson for us is this. We cannot run away, but must remain vigilant and wait for that exit visa and angelic guide. If we do try to run away, we will become bruised and senseless. And I can tell you, I've seen it happen a number of times. It's true. Those who try to run away end up more bruised and senseless than we who stay the course. Besides, we must fulfill the type of St. Joan that she gave to us, that she did not suffer in vain. So, in surrounding us, the revolutionary smog of Sodom presents at least two serious problems. Number one, it increases the ease and availability of sin. Number two, it makes it hard to avoid seeing sin, smelling it, and embracing it ourselves. Using more technical terms, by surrounding us, the smog produces occasions of sin and the danger of cooperating in evil. What are we going to do? St. Peter answers by exhorting us to fly from the pollutions of the world through the knowledge of our Lord and Savior Jesus Christ, lest we be entangled in them and be overcome with our latter state becoming worse than the former, becoming slaves of corruption, dogs returning to their vomit, sows having been washed, returning to the wallowing in the mire. He repeats himself that such souls will perish in their corruption to whom the midst of darkness is reserved. So he's not saying fly the Pentapolis, he's saying fly the pollutants. Learn how to deal with them and flee from them. So, in the knowledge of our Lord and Savior, let us now take a moment to consider two of the major pollutants mentioned by St. Peter, namely, blasphemy and impurity. Since the Pentapolis is mostly known for impurity, since this is where most men fall first, which in turn leads them to forget God and blaspheme all that is holy, let us begin here. This is the first battlefield that most men have to cross. So everyone knows that words have structure. 
They have syntax and form. That is why we say they have a grammar. The grammar of the revolutionary word flowing from the devil dragon's foul mouth described in the Apocalypse, chapter 12, is always the same, folks. The grammar of this spoken word of the devil is L-U-S-T, lust. Why so? Because these are the sins that secure souls most surely for the kingdom of revolution deep down in the earth. These sins bring a great blindness with them. Once the soul is thus blinded, they easily become very active revolutionaries. Willy-nilly, they will become helpful to the devil. Hard to stop and hard to convert. When we look at the various revolts in the history of the world, we see things have been slouching in this direction for some time. Some examples. First, at the very beginning, what was the first thing that Adam and Eve noticed after they joined in the devil's revolution? That they were now naked, having lost the garment of grace. As a result, they lusted after each other. Number two, recall how the Israelites at the foot of the mountain after having revolted from God by making the golden calf, sat down to eat and drink and rose up to play, the scriptures tell us. Rose up to play is a euphemism for acts of lust and debauchery. Number three, most large art museums show where our current revolution began with the Renaissance. The art coming from this time and following centuries into our own day display lots of immodesty and nudity. Of course, it's all considered artful. And shame on you, Father, for criticizing it. Regardless of your position on this matter, with the Renaissance, the clothes started coming off. In a recent visit to a local fine art museum to see some Renaissance works, passing through our area, they had a very immodest painting of St. Mary Magdalene after her conversion. It is almost as if the artist wants the viewer to become a Magdalene and looking upon the saint, which is ludicrous, evil, twisted, perverted. Whereas in reality, we know she was deeply penitent and very conscientious of her modesty after conversion. And she wanted everyone else to do what she was doing, penance. And wanted everyone else to follow her lead. It is no secret many artists are known to be constantly pushing the limits of morality in their works. They have a lion's share in the present crisis. Let us then not play a sort of shell game about nudity and immodesty, even in famous paintings. Make no mistake, this is an effect of the revolution's grammar at work. The fact that some defend it is just a sign that they have grown up imbibing the revolutionary waters. One last note of interest here is how this revolutionary grammar will touch us no matter what happens. We can't avoid it. It's very frustrating. There's no escaping this smog. We will be confronted with it more often here than ever before. So, either you give way to it and speak its language, get intoxicated with it, which is to capitulate to the devil and is become his friend and companion, or we fight it and we will be attacked by it. That is why so many are constantly fighting bad and impure thoughts. It is, as it were, in the air around us, like gnats and flies constantly moving in our midst. These battles must be fought. There is no escaping. Now, more on this in a moment, but consider how the very same revolutionaries that are promoting acts of lust as good and safe and healthy 
will turn on the church and her faithful, accusing them at every opportunity and even a hint of a violation. Often making a din in the mass media. Many saints, priests, and religious have been falsely accused of violating the Sixth Commandment. Read the life of St. Catherine of Siena, St. John Vianney. They were always accused of this. With apologies slow in coming. The church is constantly attacked for being backward and prudish and harsh on these matters. In other words, virginity, celibacy, marital chastity are constantly an issue for the revolutionaries. But again... The moment there is a failure in celibacy, the tables quickly turn to attack and expose a violation they would praise in another person. You see the hatred they have for the church. This indeed is the grammar at work for all to see. Now let's consider a few important points of morality on this toxic pollutant. The vice of lust, when indulged, when heeded, breaks the sixth and ninth commandments, either in act or in thought. These commandments are, Thou shalt not commit adultery, and thou shalt not covet thy neighbor's wife. Our Lord later on added, To perfect the law, you have heard that it was said to them of old, Thou shalt not commit adultery. But I say to you that whosoever shall look on a woman to lust after her hath already committed adultery with her in his heart. Now, since this part of man touches on matters of life, that is procreation, then it does not admit of any light matter. So mortal sin, mortal meaning death, has to do with matters of life and death. Since this matter, Sixth Commandment matters, touches on life, bringing forth new life, procreation, it is always grave, always. Since this part of man is about life, then it is reserved for a lifelong commitment called marriage. As we have noted, since we're living in the Pentopolis smog, laden especially with this toxin of impurity, we are sure to have many impure images and ideas regularly thrust upon us. Let us then make sure we understand when sin begins and at what point it becomes mortal. Always remembering, never forgetting, that each and every mortal sin, no matter what, is avoidable. Each mortal sin can be prevented. We have no excuses. Not true of venial sin. They can be very difficult to avoid every single venial sin. Every mortal sin, no matter what, can be avoided. Now, recall that sin is in the will. It's in the heart. Not in the eyes. It's not in the hearing or the mind or the passions. These parts of man must be connected to the will in some way before sin occurs. Sin is an abuse of our free choice of the will. Sin flows from the heart of man, as our Lord says in the Gospel. In regard to impure thoughts, therefore, sin comes with consent, which is an act proper to the will. So consenting to bad thoughts can be seen in a number of ways. By the way, what I'm going to explain now also holds for sins against the faith. If you're having temptations against the faith, the same principles hold. So, okay, what are the number of ways in which we can consent to bad thoughts? Number one, here's what happens. A thought occurs without involving the will. We get a thought. For example, when we are asleep, we have all kinds of unwilled thoughts. This can happen when we are awake too. It is sort of like someone putting a menu in front of you without you choosing anything. You see it, that is all. This first movement is not sinful because the will has not acted. 
Obviously, we must avoid putting impure menus before our eyes. Thus, we see the importance of averting our eyes from bad images and immodest people and avoiding such things as much as we can. So that's the first thing. We see something. We hear something. We have a thought. Second, after the first movement, this first thought, the will has to act or not act. And it can do three things. A, it can reject the whole thing, make acts contrary to the thoughts. This is a case of virtue. And as long as we keep it up, there's no sin. Even if the bad thought persists for a time or seem to gain some ground, Remember that St. Therese, the little flower, suffered terrible temptations against the faith. What did she do to keep her moral certainty intact? She made acts of faith nearly continuously. So, I have a bad thought and I counteract it immediately with a good thought and virtue. That's what we should do. But B, we could do nothing. We can just sit idly by while the bad thought starts to develop and grow. There's a, some negligence here. A sort of passive, well, let's see where this goes. Attitude before making a decision. The will should have intervened, but did not. Now sin of at least negligence begins. C. The will can give consent to the thought being entertained. It's sort of, well, tell me more. This is inviting the thought in for tea, as it were. Here the will is inclined to the thought it begins to take some pleasure in it. With the body often starting to react, the passions start to become inflamed. This is daydreaming and it's fantasizing. This consenting to the development of the impure thought is sinful. But St. Thomas and St. Ignatius hold that these remain on the level of venial sin. It helps to keep in mind that mortal sin is like a poison pie containing three pieces, grave matter, sufficient knowledge, and full consent of the will. That's what it takes to make a mortal sin. Think of a pie, it has three pieces, grave matter, sufficient knowledge, and full consent of the will. Thus, in this last case, although the first piece of the pie is in place, grave matter, and perhaps another piece is falling into place, sufficient knowledge, meaning I know this is forbidden fruit, nevertheless, the last piece of full consent is not in place. Giving consent to entertaining a thought is not the same as giving full consent to what the thought entails in act. But is not far away. Alarm bells should be going off at this time. The conscience is saying, ding, 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 you're in danger. So third of all, this leads to the final possibility when the person gives in to what the thought suggests, saying, yes, I will do that act if and when I can. At this point, the soul has embraced mortal sin, even though they've not acted on it in their body. Thus, the reason for the saying of his Lord and majesty, whosoever shall look on a woman to lust after her hath already committed adultery with her in his heart. If, however, the person says no to the act after saying yes to the thought and begins to fight the temptation, then he has committed venial sin for letting it go that far. But we must never forget that venial sins want to be mortal sins. They want to be that perfect pie, that perfect sin. They're practicing and paving the way for mortal sin. Thus, they should be likewise avoided and despised. A sign that one has committed to the act itself, has committed to the sin in a manner that is mortal, or at least two. One, they experience a queasy, lightheaded, intoxicating feeling. 
This is a sign that God is now leaving the soul to its own devices. Second, the person now rests in his choice as the purpose of his existence. As a result, the sinner will seek to commit acts of this kind as often as possible to renew his reason for living, thereby forming a habit and they will begin to abhor death. Because death means the end of their way of life, the reason for their existence. So we say lust abhors death. We will discuss how to prevent this from happening to us in a moment. Now, apart from lust, another major pentopolis pollutant, and the second one we're going to consider tonight, is that of blasphemy. To define our terms, blasphemy, in its strictest meaning, is the utterance of contemptuous speech against God and is always a sin against the faith and the first commandment. It necessarily involves a manifestation. It is a public act, a public act of its very nature. Blasphemy is an out-out affront to God's honor accomplished by the contemptuous denial to God of something that is His or, which is big today, the attribution to Him of something that does not belong to Him. So it's not just taking the name of the Lord in vain. Now, since the object of this scorn is the infinite majesty of God, blasphemy admits of no light matter either. Like lust, it has no light matter. Always great. It is of its nature mortally sinful. Only inadvertence or lack of awareness of one's actions can lessen its gravity. Some examples would be to say that the incarnate Word of God, Jesus Christ, the Lord of Lords and the King of Kings, is merely a man and not also divine. That's blasphemous. Or he was just a prophet, or that he was just a good teacher, or that he was not always perfectly pure, celibate and chaste. Blasphemy. Another example would be to say the Blessed Virgin Mary was not ever virgin, but had other children. Again, many do not understand how deeply offensive these things are to God. Although ignorance can excuse, nevertheless, such sins are objectively, gravely offensive to God. Sad to say, with the loss of faith among true believers, with the increasing number of infidels, with the popularity of occultism and atheism waxing strong, today few seem to miss an opportunity to mock religion, most especially the true religion revealed and established by God himself. Thus, blasphemy is becoming commonplace. We hear it all the time. Again, Sodom is covered in the smog. Basically, this means there are many occasions of sin for those living here. Many of them are unavoidable. But remember, once again, each and every mortal sin can be avoided, but not so with occasions of sin. So we need to pause and make an important distinction as there are two basic kinds of occasions of sin. Namely, those that are avoidable, those we call voluntary, and those that are unavoidable, often termed necessary due to the difficulty of removing them. St. Alphonsus Liguri, the great moral doctor of the church, he gives a couple of examples of avoidable occasions of sin. Okay, One who frequently falls into blasphemy and lying when engaged in games one who often gets drunk or gets into a fight or falls into some impurity when they go to a particular tavern or house. These are avoidable. You didn't have to do those things. Now, examples of unavoidable occasions would include things like working alongside someone that is often immodest in dress, behavior, and speech. In working with various problems of patience, Many doctors and nurses enter into necessary occasions of sin. Can't be avoided. 
In this area, St. Philip Neri has many words of advice. He says, if young men, and this applies to all of us, would preserve their purity, let them avoid bad company. We can add here bad internet, movies, and songs. These things are how the grammar of the revolution comes into our souls to pollute them with bad ideas. He goes on to say, in the matter of purity, there's no greater danger than not fearing the danger. When a man does not distrust himself and is without fear, it is all over with him, says St. Philip. We must never trust ourselves, for it is the devil's way first to get us to feel secure and then to make us fall. When a person puts himself in an occasion of sin, saying, I shall not fall, I will not fall, I will not commit the sin, it is an almost infallible sign, says the saint, that he will indeed fall, and with all the greater damage to his soul. I can handle it, I can handle it. Let's stop playing footsie with the devil and what we hear and and what we watch and what we wear, the clothing. Lest we become like Lot's wife, a pillar of salt, lost to God, a drowning victim of the revolutionary flood. Now, St. Philip goes on. He says, young men should be very careful to avoid idleness and nourishing their bodies delicately. In order to preserve their purity, young men should frequent the sacraments, especially confession. In the warfare of the flesh, only cowards gain the victory, says the saint. That is to say, those who fly. What did St. Peter say? Fly the pollutants of the Pentapolis. And this includes idleness in our thoughts and in our imagination. So St. Philip says, when sensual thoughts come to mind, we ought immediately to make use of our minds and fix them instantaneously on something or other, no matter what. So how about death? Lust abhors death. Then use death to fight lust. How about judgment? How about the eternal destinations of heaven and hell? These are good subjects to be thinking about at that time. What will I think about this on my deathbed? What would my parents say if they saw me? Those are things to think about. Let us then avoid the near or approximate occasions of sin and work to make the unavoidable ones as distant or remote as possible. This is what homeschoolers do. That's why they're homeschooling. To put some distance between their children and the occasions of sin found in the world and its systems, its school systems. This is why we put protections on our internet access. Thus, the first lesson in flying from the pollutant of lust and blasphemy and other like sins is this. We should avoid exposing ourselves to evil. We should avoid going to bad places and being around corrupted people and programs, keeping in mind that there is very little coming out of Hollywood and off the Internet which is free from this pollution. Still, not all necessary occasions of sin can be made remote. Again, these people live next door. They're members of our families. They work side by side with us, some of them. They shop at the same stores. St. Alphonsus says if an occasion is unavoidable, the faithful soul who wants to be delivered to remain wheat, to remain one of the 99, must use the means necessary to change the near occasion to a remote occasion, at least mentally and spiritually. And the means are, avoid bad company as far as possible. Frequent the sacraments, renew daily promises of baptism, pray the rosary. Read spiritual books, listen to sermons. These are things we have to do. The saint says that it is possible to be free of sin, even when in the midst of dangerous occasions, as long as we do not voluntarily place ourselves therein. We can think of St. Joan. 
So we must not freely choose to associate with lovers of this valley or carelessly use the devices produced here for enticing the young and the foolish. Things such as movies, music, video games, iPods and iPads, etc., etc. We must not love this place, but rather love and fear God and long for His heaven. Thus, St. Alphonsus concludes, God will surely not withhold His grace from the one who sincerely resolves not to offend Him. The Scriptures do not say that He will perish who is in danger, but rather He who loves the danger. Whereas one who does not want to be in danger can hardly be said to love it. St. Alphonsus then quotes St. Basil the Great who says, the one who suffers the dangerous occasion against his will, God will pour out more grace upon him lest he perish in the danger. Now, since others have been here before us, what did they do when the occasion could not be avoided? For a good example, we can look to the Scriptures. We look and find Tobias in the Old Testament, who had to dwell in a foreign land of Nineveh wherein even his fellow Israelites fell into blasphemy. We hear from that edifying book of the Bible how after suffering physical blindness and various other problems for obeying the law of God, we hear his relations, his friends, and his kinsmen mocked at his life saying, Where is thy hope for which thou gavest alms and buried the dead? The scriptures tell us the Lord permitted this trial to come upon Tobias have these mean friends and family and physical blindness. God allowed this to happen to Tobias that an example might be given to posterity of his patience so that we could talk about him today. It goes on to say how he was immovable in the fear of God, giving thanks to God all the days of his life. He was immovable in the fear of God. Underlying that always keeping the commandments and not complaining and rebelling in his trials. He feared God and was ever grateful. But how did Tobias respond to those who blasphemed against God and attacked hope in him? It says, he rebuked them, saying, Speak not so, for we are the children of saints, and look for that life which God will give to those that never change their faith in him. He spoke back, don't say those things. Okay, so in various places of the Psalms, we hear the, how people will say things like, where is your God? Many are doing that now, mocking our faith, our hope, and our church, making a byword of what is sacred and precious in the sight of the Lord. We must respond as Tobias did. Speak the truth openly and plainly as the situation permits, and this requires we study and know the faith. Now we also have the approved revelations given by His Majesty to the 19th century Carmelite mystic, Sister Mary of St. Peter. He revealed how to make reparation for such blasphemies when we hear them. We're to say, blessed be the name of God. And say it out loud if possible. We can also say the divine praise is specially written to counteract blasphemy. Blessed be God, blessed be His holy name, blessed be Jesus Christ, true God and true man. Our Lord also revealed that we should command Satan to get behind us saying, Be gone, Satan. In this way, our Lord shows who is really the author of such blasphemous thoughts and words. He also gave the same sister the revelations of his holy face, something that St. Therese, the little flower, adopted for her own. Including the special prayers for making public reparation for blasphemy. And he said to her, since the crime of blasphemy extends over the whole nation, and since it is public, I demand that reparation be extended to all the cities of the nation, and that it be public. Woe to those cities that will not make this reparation. Apart from these things, there is one more very important thing we must do, namely not despise the blasphemer. 
by recognizing the real source of the problem, the devil. This last consideration is taken up for us by St. John Climacus on a discussion of the interior life that applies to the exterior life as well. He says, if you have blasphemous thoughts, do not think that you are to blame unless you have voluntarily exposed yourselves to occasions of sin. But God knows what is in our hearts and he knows that ideas of this kind come not from us but from our enemies. In other words, we heard it somewhere or the devil is whispering it in our ears. The unholy demon not only blasphemes God and everything that is divine, it stirs up the dirtiest and most obscene thoughts within us, thereby trying to force us to give up praying or to fall into despair. It has struck at people, says the saint, whispering that there is no salvation in store for them, murmuring that they are more to be pitied than any unbeliever or pagan. Anyone disturbed by the spirit of blasphemy, he says, and wishing to be rid of it, should bear in mind that thoughts of this type do not originate in his own soul, but are caused by the unclean devil. So let us make light of him and pay no regard whatever to his promptings. Let us say, get behind me, Satan. I worship the Lord my God and I will serve him only. So to fight back, the saint is saying, don't stop praying, even if the thoughts come during prayer. If we continue to pray to the end, he says, they will retreat, for they do not struggle against those who resist them. Now, finally, the saint teaches, let us refrain from passing judgment or condemnation on our neighbor, which is easy to do when you see someone blaspheming. That person is doomed. If we do this, avoid passing judgment on persons, then we will not be terrorized by blasphemous thoughts ourselves, since the one produces the other. How many today easily pass rash judgment on others, most notably those in positions of authority? How dangerous this can be. Now we still have one last point of morality to address that is very important for the place in which we find ourselves today. Namely, what happens when we have to work for some company that may be up to no good or supports groups who do evil, like Planned Parenthood? What about paying taxes or a government that supports Planned Parenthood and the like? There's hardly a company left in America that does not have some finger in an evil pot somewhere do we partake in evil by working for them, buying products from them, selling them materials? The issue here is that of cooperating in evil, which I brought up earlier. Does the church permit us to shop at such stores or work for these companies? Clearly, this is a serious matter when living and working in this place. It is something that every faithful soul longing to escape from this valley has to confront sooner or later. It touches on what company we work for, to whom we give donations, where we shop for our goods, or whom we have for our friends. Some years ago, I remember speaking with a young man, soon to be ordained to the priesthood. He had worked for the Peace Corps down in Central America. We entered into a debate as to whether or not cultural Catholicism was desirable. Now, when we say cultural Catholicism, that's where a society at least outwardly goes along with Christian ideals and has a government that respects God's laws. He had seen some superficial Catholics down south of the border and thought that what we were doing in our secular culture was better. Now it seems to me the Peace Corps had done its job in brainwashing this good man. Having finally arrived in the Pentopolis, I wonder if he still holds to his erroneous conclusions. Oh, how much better it is to live under cultural Catholicism than to gasp for breath in this smoggy valley. 
At least in nominally Catholic cultures, a soul is free of such concerns as whether or not they're cooperating in evil by just going to the store or holding down a normal job. Well, in any case, to answer our difficulty, to solve our problem, let us first define our terms and make a few distinctions. So first of all, cooperation in evil can be defined as giving support or help to another who is intent on committing an evil. For example, a company has set aside significant earnings to support Planned Parenthood. How much do the employees of such a company participate in this evil? Another example, a family member has entered into a union which takes its name after Sodom. Can I invite them over for a meal? Can I embrace them and kiss them and support them in any way in their choice? Can I rent an apartment to such people? The list is long. I think you see the point. Among the first things the moral doctors teach us about cooperation and evil is this, that there's two levels. There's formal and there's material. Formal cooperation, material cooperation. Depending on whether one does or does not intend the evil of the other. So formal cooperation is where the person consents to the evil of another and even helps them bring about the evil when they can. They, as it were, hug it and kiss it and show off their support for it and even hope to benefit from it in some way. They want to be a part of the thing and help out where they can. So, for example, formal cooperation takes place when people support abortion by willingly signing up to work for Planned Parenthood, give money for its continuance or lobby to keep abortion legal, even though they themselves may never have an abortion. Consider a pharmaceutical company that makes two kinds of pills, Plan B and aspirin. Person of that company working to improve or promote the Plan B pill would be cooperating in evil in a formal way, wouldn't he? Even though they may never use such pills themselves, they approve others using them and would give them Plan B pills if they asked for one. A doctor prescribing them does the same. So formal cooperation in evil of another is always sinful. If the matter at hand is grave like that of Plan B, then such cooperation is always a mortal sin. Formal cooperation, therefore, must always be avoided and shunned because from its very nature it is opposed to charity. Because what is charity? Charity wants what's best for God and neighbor. It wants to avoid evil. It disapproves of evil and seeks to prevent it. So that's formal cooperation. Let's go to material cooperation. This happens when we lend someone level of material or physical support to an evil cause without willing the evil itself or agreeing with the intention of those who act sinfully. The moral theologians say there's two kinds of material cooperation, proximate and remote. One's near, one's further. So proximate means the person helping is near at hand to the sinner, closely involved in helping the evil come about, often directly supporting it in some way. Such persons might provide someone the money to have an abortion or drive them to the clinic, even though they themselves are against this course of action and even try to talk the person out of it. In the pharmaceutical company, the person who helps make and package Plan B pills offers proximate material support to an evil cause. He needs to get out of there. A pharmacist does the same thing when filling out a prescription of that kind. Thus, the reason for the legal battles over conscience some years ago for these sorts of workers. Although not as wicked as formal cooperation in evil, nevertheless, this level of support, proximate material cooperation, cannot be provided without sin. 
If the matter at hand is grave, then the sin committed by proximate material support is mortal. Because once again, such participation is directly contrary to charity. That is why some good souls have refused to bake cakes or arrange flowers or sign licenses for sodomitical unions. Attending the supposed weddings of such couples or hugging or kissing them in support of their bad choices, at minimum, falls under this level of cooperation and evil of another. In other words, it's not easy to be a good grandmother in the Pentapolis. Now, the last level we need to consider is that of remote material cooperation. The key word is remote, meaning it is not so closely or directly connected to the evil itself, but more distant or indirectly connected. This applies to all of us. Examples include providing chemicals for the pharmaceutical company that makes, among other things, Plan B pills, but they make another other variety of pills too. Someone working in the aspirin wing of this pharmaceutical company remotely cooperates in the evil of the company. They work for an evil company, but they themselves do not participate in the evil, nor do they support it. That's remote material cooperation. Buying products from a company that supports Planned Parenthood or is anti-Catholic is remote material cooperation. Obviously, this is something nearly every Christian today has to deal with as most big institutions support various things we know are wrong and hurtful to God, hurtful to His church and the whole of His created order. This includes our own government, to whom most pay taxes of some kind. This includes the companies we work for, the hospitals we visit, and those companies we buy products from. Amazon, Walmart, Apple, Microsoft. Target. It is becoming increasingly difficult to escape some level of material cooperation. Welcome to the Pentapolis. That having been said, this level of cooperation is not immediately sinful, as are the other two. While not applauding evil and always seeking its removal, Nevertheless, the church does permit the faithful soul to hold jobs such as making aspirin in the pharmaceutical company or to shop at Amazon without incurring sin, especially when there are few, if any, other reasonable options. The main reason is that the actions that constitute the remote material cooperation, for example, working a normal job, shopping for normal items, are good in themselves. They're only made sinful by the evil choices of the company who abuses our goodwill. What is more, the effect of the action itself is good. We make aspirin that lessens pain or we earn a living for our families. Yet it must be said at the same time that the more evil the company, the greater must be the reason for working with them. If we have a choice... We should pick up the lesser evil, get another job, and shop someplace else. So a little review. So far then, there are two basic levels of cooperation in evil, formal and material. Formal is where a man directly embraces the evil of another in his heart. He consents to the thing and even helps in bringing about the evil itself. This is always and everywhere sinful and must be avoided. Material cooperation has two levels, proximate and remote. Proximate involves closely helping someone else commit an evil, even if the helper does not want it himself. This too must be avoided at all costs by faithful Catholics who want to do good and avoid evil, who long to be faithful and be given an exit visa and angelic guides to escape from the Epitopolis. Finally, remote material cooperation is indirect and not touching on the evil matter itself. This can be done without sin. 
but should be avoided when possible, or at least made as distant as possible, as remote as possible. Now finally, there's an example of this in the Scriptures before we sum up tonight. There's a scriptural type that comes to our aid here. In the third book of Kings, or in some Bibles, the first book of Kings, after 1 and 2 Samuel, we find two important holy men struggling to walk circumspectly and wisely under the evil king Achab and his witch of a queen, Jezebel. These two men are Elias and Abdias. St. Elias was the fiery prophet we all know so well. He was sent to confront and correct the evil king Achab. Living at the time, the same time as St. Elias, however, where there was also Abdias, occupying the position of governor of King Achab's house. The Holy Bible says this Abdias was a good man, for he feared the Lord very much. Keep in mind that King Achab was involved with some very evil things, such as sacrificing little children regularly to demons. Although Abdias was working in the king's house, he had nothing to do with these evils. The scriptures do not condemn him for holding this position. Thus, he comes under remote material cooperation for holding this position. Remote material cooperation with this evil king. What is more, while in his place, this good man was able to save at least a hundred prophets from the hands of Jezebel. He was able to bring good out of evil. This story is important because it shows us the paths that are possible. Perhaps our conscience and sensibilities, being like that of Elias, will not allow us to cooperate in evil, even remotely. This is becoming increasingly difficult to do in the Pentopolis. Such men may be forced to do what Elias did, namely flee to the deserts and mountaintops to live as the hermits did of old. But few have the strength to do this. And for Joan, it was forbidden. Maybe we're in the position of Joan. Yet at the same time, other men fearing God, like Abdias, can do what many others have done before them. Seek to make any participation in evil as indirect and distant as possible. Always keeping it at a level of remote material cooperation with what little power they have. And if need be, speaking out like an Elias, like a Thomas More, when the time may call for it. In doing so, such men will surely save souls and fulfill the Scriptures, where it says, Brethren, walk circumspectly, not as unwise, but as wise, redeeming the time, because the days are evil. Let us now summarize what we've learned tonight. Heavy-duty moral conference, I know. First of all, Although we're living in a morally polluted and toxic environment, others have been here and have become saints. What they did as individuals, the whole church is now enduring as a whole. We are in a saint maker. Number two, we cannot escape this valley except by way of an exit visa and angelic guides being given from above. This exit must be merited through patient endurance. We are being tested. We must remain wheat among a field of cockle, come what may. Third of all, among the major pollutants are lust and blasphemy. We must distance ourselves as much as possible from occasions where they are sure to occur. If it is unavoidable, then we must make the occasion as remote as possible. This is why we put blocks on our internet access, on our phones, on our computers, on everything we have. Don't play games with yourself. Put the block on. Fourth, if it is lust, we should follow the advice of St. Philip Neri and others 
There are handouts provided in the back. If it is blasphemy, we should do as Tobias did, say that such things are not right and give reasons why when possible with firmness and charity. Meanwhile, we should say, blessed be God. We shall avoid condemning the blasphemer as well. We should avoid condemning the blasphemer, knowing it really is the devil at work and make reparation for the blasphemy, such as using the holy face devotions, even saying out loud, blessed be the name of God and be gone, Satan. Five, when living in a time of laxity, when living in Sodom, it behooves us not to test the limits as so many do today, but to overcorrect, walking back some. This is not the time to make the grammar more acceptable, as many are trying to do with these synods on the family and marriage. The threat of mitigating priestly celibacy is another example. No! We need more modesty, more chastity, more fidelity. Now is the time to pull back and dig in and stand our ground. And finally, as Tobias did before us, no matter what happens, fear God and be grateful. The more we employ these means, the more merits will be gained and the quicker God will provide us and Abraham to intercede for our delivery. Let us end this conference tonight with the prayer revealed to Sister Mary of St. Peter about the Holy Face. Eternal Father, I offer Thee the Holy Face of Jesus, covered with blood, sweat, dust, and spittle, in reparation for the crimes of communists, blasphemers, and by the profaners of His holy name and of the holy day of Sunday. Thank you for listening. In the name of the Father, and of the Son, and of the Holy Ghost. Amen.